Hello, Betty Page fans. Welcome to the inaugural edition of the official Betty Page podcast. I'm Mark Morey, and I'm your host, along with the very lovely Tori Rodriguez. Hi, Tori. How are you? Hey, Mark. I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty well, and I'm very excited that we're starting this podcast about Betty Page to talk about all things to do with Betty. Me too. Can't wait for that deep dive. Uh, so, Tori, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about in this uh, episode? Well, we're going to get into um, our origin stories, how we met, what drew us into um, the Betty verse and led us to become interested in Betty. But we're also going to focus a lot on what is it about Betty, that ever relevant question that, that seems impossible to answer, but, um, you know, just about anyone who knows about her will ultimately ponder. Um, and so as I wrote in the little book of Betty, I, I said the answer is both obvious and elusive at the same time. And there are a million reasons to admire her, but it's impossible to pinpoint the precise thing that fuels her fans intense allegiance. So this might be a good time for you to tell us, uh, you know, what it was about Betty that, that got you interested in, in focusing her as a, as a, focusing on her as a subject in Betty Page Reveals All. Well, you know, with Betty Page, it's like peeling an onion, and you just keep finding new layers, new layers, new layers. I know you just you came up with this layer of how Betty Page was actually doing yoga poses. I thought that was brilliant. But when I first uh, <laughs> when I first uh, got interested in Betty. It was, you know, her photographs. I mean, her photographs have so much life in them. I mean, she she conveys this genuineness and this beauty in a photograph like nobody else, I think, ever has. I think she's the number one photographic actress model in the world. In fact, by my calculation, she was the most photographed model in the 20th century. And so I think really wow. what is it about Betty Page could kind of be a, a, a the ongoing theme in this podcast, because it's really kind of amazing when you peel back the layers of what Betty Page is about, who she is, what effect she has on people. So, you know, what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, for all those reasons, she, she you know, you, you, once you become interested in Betty, you do start realizing that there, there's just, there's always something to uncover. And that's why, you know, even after, you know, you've been working with Betty, so to speak, for how long now? Like probably 15, first, 20 years? Yeah, I first met Betty in 1996. Wow. And it took me from 96 to 2012 to get the film finished. And we can talk about that if people want to hear about it at some point. But so I yeah. really had to dig in. If you're going to make a film biography of somebody, you really have to understand them well. And the more I dug into Betty, the more I fell in love with her, who she is. I mean, lots of people love the photographs, mm -hmm. my photographs work and who she is. That's what really, that's, I mean, I'm just still amazed at the things I discover about Betty Page. Yeah. And I think, you know, you really kind of captured it. I think your experience is very similar to a lot of other people's experience, including mine. Like, you know, you, you first, you discover her, you, you hear her name, you, you see her images and you're blown away. Of course, for all the reasons you described, you know, she's just there. I mean, there's no one else that I've ever seen who can, you just look at an image and just all this life just jumps out at you. You know, she's just so vibrant and joyful and just so, um, like comfortable and and happy in her body you know you can just see it in her movements and but then you know of course that that compels you to learn more about her and when you learn her backstory and all the th hardships that she endured and all the the amazing triumphs that she had too you know um, like being a a college graduate in the forties when less than, you know, 4% of college graduates were women at that time, just all that stuff. And that's just, of course, one of many details, but you know, it's when you really get to know her, so to speak, that's what kind of hooks you in. Right. Keeps well, you, you captivated. Um, yes. You, you mentioned she was a college graduate in the forties and that is an important point. I mean, women generally did not go to college in those days. Like my father was the only son in his family. He went to college. His sisters did. That was, you know, how it was back then. Yeah. Generally. But um, 
you know, the thing about Betty is she's just, you know, she has this amazing, she's a, she's a, a force of nature, I like to say. She, and mm-hmm. that's what comes across in her photographs. It re- I mean, the photographs reflect who she is, her personality. And when you discover, uh, she was, well, what, one thing you reminded me of, she was, she was not a conscious feminist, but she did right. things that women didn't generally do. So she yeah. objectively, she was some sort of a feminist, but it wasn't like a, an ideology with her or something. Uh, yep, I agree completely. And, um, you know, I actually did a blog post about that on BettyPageFitness.com. I think it was actually called like, was Betty Page really a feminist or something like that? Because people do sort cite her as a feminist hero. And yet other people have pointed out like, wait, no, Betty Page was not a feminist. You know, she's never said she was a feminist. And, you know, furthermore, here's why she's not a feminist. But my argument is, you know, yeah, you, you could have feminist scholars lecturing all day. And of course, they're important and have, you know, valuable contributions but you know then it's you you can't discount the influence that someone like betty has had on on countless women in their daily lives um and you know that's part of again back to what is it about betty you know so again you have her massive you know um physical appeal and even just beyond sort of just static appearance but you know again the things we described the qualities of her that you can just see that jump off the page at you but um women have told me that betty has helped them recover from eating disorders sexual trauma she's given them strength and resilience to leave abusive relationships um you know and so how can you again, how can you discount that or minimize that and say, no, she, she wasn't really a feminist. You know, I think in its very essence, that's very feminist. (laughs) Well, yeah, I think you, you pointed out the distinction just because Betty didn't think of herself as a feminist doesn't mean she wasn't acting in ways as an independent woman going to college, living on her own as a single woman in New York in the fifties and all these sorts of things. And her attitude about sex, everything, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the, the, and speaking about sex, you know, it's it's often, I think one of the things that, that people find most interesting about her is, and, and which, of course, you, you covered in Betty Page Reveals All, um, it was the fact that she really sort of paved the way, as it's stated often, for the sexual revolution of the 60s. And you, you explained that really well for me. I think one time I even said, could you help me with that? Like, help me get from point A to B in that process. Well, I think Betty was surprised to hear that when she, I think she heard that statement, you know, maybe in the early 90s. Um, and she says, the way she put it was, well, they say I'm a initiator or progenitor of the sexual revolution. And she kind of laughs, but I think her, her, her attitude about nudity and just having the complete self-confidence with that, no shame, no, you know, when she got arrested one time for posing nude, they charged her with a decent explosion. She says, I'm not indecent. She went before a judge. She refused to plead guilty to that. And because she was so, so, uh, uh, taken to such a strong stand, they had to back off and reduce the charge on her. So that's part of the, but you see. I love that story. That all comes through, all of that attitude of hers comes through in the photograph. That's why the photographs are so good. Yeah. The genuine person who Betty is, that smile and her comfort in her own body and all of that is, is, is what comes through. And that's also related to the body image issue because what you mentioned reminded me, Mm -hmm. I was making this film Like I I went into a a Mac store and to buy some equipment related to the film and a young girl behind the counter asked me, well, what I was, what was I making a film about? I just said, Betty Page. She goes, Oh, Betty Page. Oh, she's my hero. And you know, this was a girl in her twenties and uh, you know, she had Betty bangs. And then that happened again when I went to another place to rent some equipment, another young woman, I started realizing, Oh, well, you know, there's the, all this whole, young female audience for Betty Page. And I've had to do, they, they, yeah, yeah. 
had to do with gaining confidence in their own sexuality through but Betty Page. Maybe you can explain that, Tori. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, you know, it's it's interesting because I've been thinking about it even more, obviously, in preparation for, for this podcast and just, you know, trying to clarify some thoughts around that. And, you know, as I, I wrote um, in the little book of Betty as well, how um, she, Betty really is is her own archetype in a sense, you know, she's become, you know, a lot of people sort of say, oh, she, you know, she's sort of captures like the goddess archetype, which is true in a sense. But I think her appeal comes more from the fact that she's like more of an every woman archetype. You know, she does clearly have like, she is a goddess. She's amazing. She's sensual and sexual and beautiful. Um, but I think what really resonates with, with people and women in particular is that there's also something very accessible about her. It's right. like, I, oh, okay, well, she's like me. You know, I, I can be that way too. I, those qualities are available to me as well. And I think that transcends, of course, gender. And I think, you know, e even a lot of, of men are, have been very inspired by that as well, because it just, it's a reminder of the full range of expression that's really available to us that we often don't, we often stay in these little boxes and don't express ourselves fully like Betty does, even in a photo. Well, and I think if you think about it, the way Betty's career went, lends itself to who she is because if you think about hollywood stars or pinup girls they were controlled by a certain kind of corporate media pr machine and there was limited photographs and none of none of those photographs whether it's marilyn monroe or any anybody lives up to the betty page photographs i don't think but you see the other thing is betty page did like i said before more photographs than any other model. She wasn't controlled by some corporate entity. She was posing for these camera clubs, for Erling Claw. I mean, she would pose for anybody who would pay her. And um, her her face was on the cover. In the 1950s, you couldn't walk past the newsstand without seeing her on the face on the cover of a magazine. I mean, these were not Life Magazine or Time Magazine. It was things yeah. like Twitter and Flirt. But um, so the fact that she got herself out so ubiquitously um, and, and who she was, all of that contributed to this whole phenomenon of Betty Page. Absolutely. I love that point. I don't think about that very often, how she really was. She was a free agent. She was a freelance model, essentially, right? And it, that's that's really fascinating that she was, again, just kind of more more proof of how independent she was. And I always, I think about her sometimes, like living in New York alone in the 1940s, supporting herself and it's just, it's really kind of mind blowing. Um, yeah, well, she's obviously very independent. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, another interesting point that you made, and I think there's not a lot of clarity around it, is the fact that she, there were, like you said, you couldn't walk past a newsstand without seeing Betty on a magazine. So that's interesting. So there was some sense of celebrity around her even at that time because i think a lot of people tend to think she became famous later or well, well later there, there was in this sense one the audience in the 50s was almost totally male two in the early part of the 50s in her career her, her it was just her picture not her name she became big enough that they actually started using her real name although in many cases they spelled it b-e-t-t-y because she became enough a celebrity among this kind of pulp magazine scene that uh they were you know using her real name so in other words people would recognize her name and, yeah uh, yeah so that was uh uh there wasn't i don't know of anybody else i can think of like that exactly that was doing what betty's doing wow and you said so i was going to ask you how how sort of and when you realized that the sort of the bulk of her audience or the balance of her audience was starting to shift toward at least like half women or maybe even started to become predominantly women. Well, the, and I, it, was it when you did just start organically, like, you know, started running into these women who. Right. That's, that's what I mean. That's what, that's what got my mind open to it. So then I started digging into mm -hmm. it. You know, I met these young girls who were working at these places where I was doing business and they were just, I mean, they were flipping about Betty Page and, the fact that I was making a movie about her. And um, yeah, so then I, I realized it was more of a phenomenon. I started, you know, doing more research. And I realized 
you know, there was all these, there's a whole pinup model community. Then I realized she's like the patron saint of many subcultures, right? Tattoo culture, yeah. gay culture, um, uh, pinup culture. I mean, she's just like, you know, a big deal to a lot of subgroups in America and around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, and, and she, there's, she has this huge fan base all over the world and she's still considered not mainstream, which is part of her appeal. You know, she was never mainstream. Mm-hmm. She say she's not mainstream. Uh, there, you know, so she, there's this kind of anti-authoritarian thing about her, I think that people perceive. And of course that was like Betty's attitude when she was in front of the judge. Right. So, so, um, I was going right. to say there's fan. She has fans all over the world. In fact, when I was making Betty Page reveals all, we got financial support from Betty fans from over 26 different countries. Wow. Yeah. That is so fascinating. And you know, and what's, what's really fascinating to me too. And that we, of course we've talked about this is how, you know, when it comes down to it, Betty is, absolutely and really indisputably the most emulated person in history worldwide you know and we've you know you've got elvis impersonators but again it's sort of just uh you know it's not like they're walking around in their daily lives looking like elvis going to work in in an office looking like elvis or (laughs) well yes you know that's uh, that's a really interesting thing um because I hadn't heard that said exactly that way before. So why don't you describe some more about how she's the most emulated person? Like what are some of the emulations? Yeah. So, you know, it it just sort of occurred to me um, at a certain point, like, wait, you know, like we've got all these, what I, what I refer to as, as Betty babes, um, you know, like literally walking around in lots of different countries, you know, rocking the Betty bangs and, and kind of fashioning themselves after Betty in in various ways. And I love how some women, you know, kind of do a, like a more modern twist on it with like funky hair colors and, you know, um, like edgy makeup or, or whatever, um, piercings, et cetera. And others do kind of more of a classic Betty look, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, it just kind of occurred to me and it was like, is there anyone else in history who has these scores of fans, like literally walking around in their daily lives, looking like them? And it's not just like they're putting on a costume and, you know, looking like Betty for Halloween or something. It's that, you know, they, they have the Betty haircut. They wake up every day and dress like Betty. Um, You know, they, they, and and more so than that, they, they call on like some of Betty's traits, her strength, her resilience, um, just the knowledge of what she went through and she was able to get through. And it's sort of like, I can too, because Betty did. And people literally say that specifically and explicitly like, you know, if Betty can do it, I can too. Yeah, really. You've heard people say that, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in, in terms of like, you know, lots of different types of hardships, but also, uh, you know, commonly in terms of body image, which, you know, which you referred to earlier. But um, a lot of women have described how Betty really helped them become more comfortable in their own bodies. And some of it's because they're like, okay, well, she's, she was curvier than like the average supermodel. But for a lot of women, it's, it's, it's beyond that. It's, it's more of like what we've talked about in terms of like, she's just so comfortable in her body, you know, no matter what, like if there's some cellulite showing or just, you know, whatever it's, there's some, some perceived imperfections, so to speak. But it's like the, the more important thing for her is, is life and joy and movement Right. It's accepting yourself for who you are, being comfortable in your own skin, that sort of thing. And this yeah. body image thing, I think, is actually maybe connected to the feminism question because, you know, mm-hmm. in the United States and a lot of uh, advanced industrial countries, you know, these supermodels are held up as the ideal of beauty, right? And you perfect body, perfect hair, perfect face, whatever that means to them, to the corporate media, um, you know, and that that's a standard that really nobody can live up to. And that that's part mm-hmm. of what a problem for women. Right. Is how, how I'm not sexy. How, I'm not I don't look like that. That's not a good thought. But that's the right. way, way the culture is. The corporate culture encourages all that sort of yeah. thing. And so 
and this is what happened when I was talking to some of these young women who were Betty Pan fans. That's where I was understanding this phenomenon that that whoever you are, you can be sexy and have confidence in yourself. And that's what they got from Betty Page. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, you, and you, you touch on a good point there is, which is what I've realized is that, you know, it does, it extends beyond it's, it's not so much of, you know, of course you do have women who are like, I want to be just like Betty Page, but a lot of, for a lot of women, it's more like she inspired me to be myself. Right. Which and I think is a, think a critical distinction. Yeah. Right. And I think some women go through a stage of, you know, trying to look like Betty Page, at least with the bangs. And this is mm-hmm. what Dita Montes did. She started out being a Betty imitator. But I think she yep. evolved into something else, partly inspired by who Betty really was. Yeah. And even Dita, um, she, she actually wrote the foreword for the little book of Betty. And she... Um, even says something along the lines of like having learned about Betty's story and what she went through. She was like, it inspired me to give my own, you know, shot at, at starting a try or, you know, something to that effect. Yeah. But um, yeah. So even, even Queen Dita. <laughs> yeah. Well, she had, had, had the, followed the Betty path. There's this great interview with her in my film. And we, we did the interview at this uh, Betty page event in Hollywood it was like after Betty had passed away, um, uh, there, would, there was like an art show, a Betty art. And uh, Dita was attending there as a kind of a celebrity guest. And you see in my film, she's all dressed up with this hat and this outfit. And then she even had this pink table with this pink chair. And the chair, very, yes. Very cinematic, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. She's yeah, great. that was great. She's always happy to talk about Betty Page. Oh yeah. Yeah. She, um, she actually, you know, I I actually quoted the both of you in an article that I wrote, um, several years ago, uh, called, and I didn't actually write this title, but, um, (laughs) it's called, um, male fans made her a star. Female fans made her an icon. I think something like that. Um, based on what you had told me about the, you know, her, her fan base becoming mostly women and, uh, both you and Dita are quoted in that, in that article as to why we were still, even back then you and I were trying to answer, what is it about Betty? <laughs> well, yeah. We, we, we should put that on our tombstones eventually, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll be able to answer it by then. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to find out now. <laughs> yeah, but if you think about it, back in the 50s, like we were talking about, Betty Page's audience was almost exclusively male. I mm-hmm. mean, there were some females, but... You know, it was the pinup magazines and men's magazines, and it was only, I mean, no, those guys in those days, it didn't even occur to them that women might be interested in Betty, right? It was yeah. this, this kind of sexy pictures, you know, get guys going kind of thing. Well, then, you know, after, in, a, in the 19, by the time of the 1980s, and Betty had been off the scene for a long time, then uh, Dave Stevens saw a picture of her and put her in his Rocketeer magazine. And that's when I think it began to turn because that's when the comic book people then became Betty fans. And there's another subgenre of, you know, where Betty's a big deal is in the comic book field. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, Greg Theakston did the Betty pages. And then you started seeing these events where girls would come out dressed up like Betty Page, Olivia, the Berardinis talks about that in the film. And uh, yeah, so that's when, so there was a turn there where the audience became really predominantly women. And that's kind of, yeah, that's fascinating. And, and I've noticed too, even, um, you know, with a lot of the, a lot of the male fans today, you know, of course you have the ones that are just like, Oh, Betty. Yeah. You know, it's just more of a physical attraction thing. Um, But then, you know, and I'm sure, as you've noticed, there are a lot of men who, same situation, deeper, like a deeper interest. They feel even sort of a deeper connection to Betty. And so even there, it's sort of a unique situation. Yeah, that's true. I mean, in other words, Betty's being appreciated on so many different levels. And this is part yeah. of what I'm talking about, about what is it about Betty? And it just seems like the 
the levels and the angles at which you can come up, but they're just endless. I mean, like I was mentioning earlier, you discover because you're a yoga teacher, you realize that a lot of these poses of Betty were exactly duplicating actual yoga poses. And I guess we don't know whether Betty actually knew yoga or that was just, I don't know, what do you think? You know, it's funny, actually, this is something that I've been kind of thinking about over time. Um, I almost wonder if Betty was imitating poses that she saw elsewhere, including in that, I don't know if you've ever seen that that Marilyn Monroe spread in Life Magazine from the 40s, which would make a lot of sense. Betty probably, I mean, it would make a lot of sense that she was into the models and actresses at that time. And, and she clearly had an interest in Marilyn as she talked, she'd mentioned her several times later in life and in interviews. Um, so I always wonder if Betty saw that Life Magazine spread of Marilyn and just sort of practiced those poses and thought, I'm going to try some of those in photo shoots when I get a chance. Well, um, yes, but just, just, right. just as an example of, of how it might've happened. Cause I, I can't imagine that she was going to yoga classes or anything or training with like a, um, you know, she probably had limited resources and doubt was getting like private yoga lessons from like <laughs> the big gurus of the time or anything. I may be wrong. I do know she was working out in a gym though. She went to um, the New York athletic club several mm -hmm. times. And maybe she saw something there. Maybe uh, so. Yeah. You know, um, but it's fascinating. You've posted so many pictures of Betty in various yoga poses and you know what all they are and the names of them and all of that and uh, yeah really part of the basis for betty page fitness isn't it it is yeah and not just not just the yoga poses but there are like lots of other poses where you know she's in a like a squat or a lunge or you know some other move, you know, pose that resembles a fitness move and so yeah so i i sort of strung a bunch of those together and created an actual workout based on those uh, poses yeah, that was a video, right? Yeah, actually, there's a um, there's two videos. There's one total total body strength and cardio, and then there's a yoga, a Betty Page yoga video. Well, you know, Betty. I mean, that's this is just no, women didn't work out in the fifties. They they um, yeah had these little machines that would jiggle their butt, and that was about it. Right? Yeah, the slim the slimming machines. And sometimes yep. they would have their heels on when they did that, right? So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, it, it, what you're right, but you know, back in the '50s, you know, the the gyms were pretty much filled with men, and it wasn't a place where you would see you really just really wouldn't see women there. And it, it's really interesting to imagine Betty sort of marching in there and <laughs> taking her rightful place among all the sweaty, grunty men. Yeah, to get her workout on, but um, well, she and she, and she. If you look at some of the pictures of her body, she has muscle definition all over the place. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no, there's, mm -hmm. it's all that's part of her beauty. She she enhanced her natural beauty with those workouts, and like there's some pictures of what you see of her back. I oh mean, yeah, amazing. You know? It is beautiful. Yeah, I, I do. I noticed I, I noticed that as well. And of course, a lot of that is, is your, like sort of like what you're alluding to. A lot of that is just her natural beauty and, and genetics. But she she did have a lot of muscle definition. She was clearly very strong, which is one of the things, again, just in her physical image that's really appealing. Like, wow, that's, you know, the strength and um, just power that you can see in, in her body and um, she just had this incredible flexibility. And another thing that's really interesting, just sort of a side note, like she's always, sometimes it just defies reason. I'm like, how is she sitting on those rocks? How is she standing this way and like balance? Like, doesn't that hurt her feet? You know, like, it's just almost like, how are you even human lady? Well, yeah, I mean, I think she was, she was in another world when she was posing. Cause I think she felt like she was very natural at that, almost born to do that. And, you know, mm -hmm. the started when, when you said the thing about looking at the Marilyn pictures, I think that could be true because she started, she talks about how she and her sister, when they were teenagers, yeah, were posing, looking at Sunday magazine and posing like movie stars. And you can see a little bit of that in my film and in some of her pictures. Um, but you know what I think the bottom line thing about Betty Page is? It's the joy that comes out of her. 
you know, yeah. when you see her smile and it's just so genuine. See, that's the difference between her and a lot of movie stars and models that you see in photographs. They're posing and maybe they're smiling, but, you know, this, Betty projects this joy of life that just can't be missed. And it's that's one of the. Yeah, that's where maybe the bottom line thing about her. I agree. And I think it, on a, in a broader sense, it's her humanity, right? Like we, and that's what, again, that back to that recognition thing, there's something that we recognize when we look at her, you know, especially that first time it's like, Whoa, wait, wait, there's something here. You know, it's not just like looking at like some other thing that's like separate from us. It's like this, there's something of me in this too. And it's like, again, that, like you said, that joy that a lot of us tend to forget is within us or available to us and it right. kind of gets and tamped, tamped down by the daily grind. Yeah. I bet he gets you in touch with it. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, so Murray, looking, looking forward to exploring a whole lot more of that. Well, you know, I think one of the things I realized, and this is what happened to me, um, I, I saw a bunch of Betty Page pictures when I was in a little store in, in Atlanta in Little Five Points in the early 90s. And I thought, wow, there's something about her. Didn't know her name or anything. It turned out to be Betty. So then later, when I had a chance to make the film, and we can tell that story at some point, um, I uh, yeah, I said, oh, there's her name is Betty Page. Okay, now I get it. So a lot of people I run into kind of, maybe they recognize her image, but they don't even know that her name is Betty Page. That's mm -hmm the sort of basic level that a lot of people, I mean, her image is so, is so pervasive in the culture that a lot of people don't even realize that they're, you know, recognizing Betty Page. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And we, you know, we've talked before about how like some of the famous examples of, of people who've emulated her, you know, Madonna has, has rocked the Betty look various times throughout her career. And um, of course we had Katy Perry, who did like a straight up Betty look, you know, for a long part of her uh, career and has revisited again recently as well. Um, and Beyonce, Beyonce, she was such a big fan of Betty that she made a video with her own money, not from the record company, where she wow. reenacted one of the Betty Page eight millimeter films. And you can see that in my film. What we do is we take the original scenes that Betty did and put them right next to the scenes that Beyonce did. And you can see how Beyonce, I mean, Beyonce talked about Betty as being a big fan of Betty. Yeah, yeah, she did. I think because I think she she sort of did a Betty inspired look at a couple different videos, and I, she still kind of had the Betty bug after that first one. And I think that's when she she did the thing you're talking about, where she fund sort of funded her own video. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a great video. Um, yeah. You know what, Tori? Maybe I'll talk a little bit about how I met Betty Page, and then after that, you, you can. You can talk about, you know, how you got into the Betty Page thing. Yeah, and then, but maybe we will we'll we'll save some of that for a future episode. But um, you right. know, people always ask me how I, you know, got connected with Betty, and yeah, it was in, in 1996. I was having lunch with my entertainment lawyer in Los Angeles. He was one of my best friends, and Bob Darwell, great guy. In fact, maybe we'll have him on the podcast someday. But um, uh, yeah, he showed me the book, Betty Page, Life of a Pinup Legend, before it was published. It had not been published. He had a pre-publication copy. And he started, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And then, then I recognized, oh, that's the woman I saw in that little store in Atlanta. That's when I put the name with it, Betty Page. Ah, okay. And, and then he said, you know, I'm negotiating with HBO uh, to do a documentary about her, but... Now they want to do a feature film, but they don't want to, I forget his exact words. He couldn't come to a deal with them. And I said, well, let me do it. I want to make the film about her. And so he arranged for me to meet Betty. <laughs> and, you know, in those days, Betty just did, never saw anybody. I mean, she was a recluse. I mean, I'm guessing there was like maybe half a dozen yeah. people who actually dealt with her in person. You could, she could get her on a, on a radio talk show or something. That happened a few times, but in person, she just didn't want to be recognized. Now, she did. I did take her out to lunch many times, and she would enjoy herself, but she wasn't really being recognized. She still looked great. She still had the bang, but, um, you know, she was living yeah. 
She was living on Social Security way out in Granada Hills, out in the suburbs of Los Angeles. And I think it was even a halfway house that had been there as a result of her release from Patton State. And anyway, right. Betty and I, you know, became friends and she agreed to make the movie right away. But the thing I had trouble with was agree. I thought I would just do an on-camera interview with her, right? She wouldn't agree to that. And I thought, well... So you didn't realize at the time that she was like, that was off limits. Maybe even if I realized, I figured... You didn't out, realize that oh, at the time? Well, I, I don't know if I did or not. Yeah. <laughs> I did overcome it. I said, okay, yeah. I'm going to hire a Hollywood makeup person, a Hollywood hair person, and, you know, that'll convince Betty. Well, I never could convince her. So this lawyer friend of mine, Bob Darwell, that introduced me to her, he says, well, she was in her 70s. And he says, you don't know how long she's going to be around. So maybe you should just record, audio record some material with her. And I thought, OK, well, that's good for research. So I actually, on two separate occasions, mm -hmm. one in 96 and one in 99, I did the one in 99 because that was only after that we found out about Patton State. But um I did these, they were two or three hours each. And I just asked her everything I could think of. And so I looked at that as research, you know, that wasn't, and it was only later that I realized, okay, she's not going on camera, but I can make a film with just her voice. And it actually <laughs> turned out better that way. You know? I love it. I think it turned out amazingly. And, every, and, and you know, and you're right. And that's something that a lot of people mention when they talk about the movie is like how they loved hearing her voice. And I think, I thought that was so just really just a special touch to that. She got to tell her story. That's one of the things I love about the movie. Right. In her own words. Yeah. She basically provided yeah. the narration for the movie. And that's from those audio recorded interviews that I did with her. Yeah. So that, another so, great thing. Like my like idea, my lawyer for that. Maybe for that. So. Yeah. That was, that was a great suggestion. <laughs> and and, and hopefully I, we'll be hearing some, some snippets of that. And you and I met when Betty Page Reveals All showed at the Great Plaza Theater in Los An in, uh, in Atlanta, right? We did, yeah. I actually, because I was on Friday. fire with Betty, you know that I, <laughs> I just I just caught the Betty the Betty bug that year. Actually, I was late to the game, um, but I had seen um, the notorious Betty Page Reveals All, which of course had come out earlier, and that launched me into trying to find out as much as I could about her. And through that, I found out about your movie, um, which was, was, did the movie come out in 2013? Or that was when you were doing your, your screening tour. We did a premiere in, uh, at Las Vegas at the, uh, the Rockabilly thing in 2012, but then it took a while to get it set up with the distributor. So it was released in theaters in 2013. Okay, so that makes sense. So then you were, you were sort of making your rounds, attending some of the openings and, and things like that. And so we, I, you know, got in touch with you. And for some reason, you, you allowed me to get involved <laughs> in, in uh, organizing the Betty Fest. You remember that was what the, what the event was called. Um, so it's like produced this, this whole event around it. And we had Greg Theakston there. And I did want to mention him and, and may he rest in peace because he actually passed on Betty's birthday a couple of years ago. Um, but he was, he was a guest uh, at the Betty Fest and had some of the Betty Pages copies there. And um, we had uh, the, the Atlanta School of Burlesque participating and it was a really great time. Um, and then, yeah. So you and I have, have stayed in, in contact since then. Well, and it was old home week for me because I had gone to college in Atlanta and lived there many years. And when my first film was successful, I had gone to Los Angeles and New York. But so coming back to the Plaza Theater, to the old neighborhood that I used to live in and all the hangouts and, and have my film show up, show there. And for you to organize a whole thing around it, that was just great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it worked out. It worked out awesomely. Sure thing. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, but I think it, it is really, you know, fascinating. I think about it sometimes. And I'm like, wow, this this many years later. So going into, you know, almost eight years for me and uh, 25 years for you with <laughs> knowing Betty. And and still, like, you, it doesn't fade. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm over that. I've lost interest. It's, you know, 
right. it's taken its course or any of that. It's just still, it's always fresh. And again, it, 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 it's because we can never truly answer that question of what is it about Betty? Because it's always fun to well, try. We can always try, exactly. And you've written two books about Betty. You've done two video exercise videos, right? You have a whole mm-hmm. business with uh, uh, yoga mats and different things. And you have Betty, yeah, Betty Page yoga mats. BettyPageFitness.com. So, you know, and I here I made the film that was released uh, nine years ago, but I'm now we're doing this podcast because we're just more into Betty than ever, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, again, it comes back to the fact that she, you know, again, she's, she really is the springboard for all these huge issues that we could just, you know, spend forever unpacking. You know, as we've, as we've said, it's like, you know, certain issues that are relevant to her include like the sexuality, creativity, aging, you know, of course, that's a big one. And we have so much to say about that, because that was one of her, her, you know, big, big issues, not wanting to be seen on camera because she was getting older and didn't like how she looked as she aged. Um, and in perhaps ironically, body positivity, um, we'll get more into that over time and the fitness and the feminism question again, and um, just all kinds of, of rich topics that we can explore yeah, so with Betty as be our filter. About, yeah, we're going to be talking about all of that stuff related to Betty and more in future podcasts. And uh, we'd love to hear from the Betty fans. Um, you can get in touch with us on the Betty Page Reveals All Facebook page. or what? And what are your, your contact? Yeah, and so you can find Betty Page Fitness on Instagram um, and Facebook. And you can always uh, feel free to visit visit BettyPageFitness.com and um, reach out through the site or leave a comment there. Right. And there's also Betty Page Reveals All is on Twitter also. Um, and um, and so- there, I do also want to mention that um, BettyPage.com um, has like a, a really solid backstory on Betty and lots of cool Betty you know, products and, and other goodies. Right. They participated in and supported the film too. So, yeah, they're they're a, a great part of the Betty community. Um, yeah. So I guess we're getting ready to close out here, Tori. So uh, we don't have. Oh you man. Know, <laughs> well, I know it's fun, and we'll do it again soon. Uh, more more to come. Um, but we have talked about your your books, your materials, your yoga mats, and my movie. I just want to say my movie, Betty Page Reveals All, is available on uh, iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, YouTube. It's available on many, many uh, platforms. It's also on musicboxdirect.com. So uh, all you have to do is Google the film and you can find it. And uh, so that's we're the sponsors of this podcast. Right, Tori? (laughs) <laughs> we are and on that note I, you you reminded me I, I should mention that um the, the both books the little book of betty taking a page from the queen of pinups and um my other book uh that i created with betty's nephew ron brim who we'd love to have as a guest on the show at some point um that book is called betty page the lost years and it explores her later years um through the lens of mainly her letters that she wrote to her sister goldie who is Ron's mom. And, um, and both of those books can be found on Amazon or Target or wherever, Barnes and Noble. What'd and there's pictures of Betty from that era, the lost years, right? You have in that book? Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple couple of rare photos of Betty um, from the 60s and 70s in there as, long, as well as some of her like really early years and, and some of during her pinup years um, with Goldie, some candid, like sort of candid informal modeling shots. So uh, well, lots of never never before seen stuff in there and that reminds me of some one thing i want to say before we sign off i am still amazed at seeing new photographs of betty page that i've never seen before and i've spent like you said 25 years looking at digging through organizing collecting betty page photographs i i think i collected something like 20,000 individual discrete images that i wow. on a hard drive then i used a thousand of those in the film but like even on Facebook the other day, someone posted a picture of Betty I'd never seen before. And that happens regularly. I mean, it's really amazing. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It's, 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 it really is crazy. I'm just like, how much did this woman actually work? I mean, she must've worked 
practically every day for that whole, what, like eight year period or whatever it was. Well, I, I did the math. Yeah, this is why I came up with the idea that she was the most photographed model, because she would go to these camera clubs. There would be 20, 30 guys there. And if they each shot several rolls of film, mm. how many days she did that, that that's far beyond what photographs taken of anybody else. So some of the guys, some of those guys did have film in their cameras. <laughs> <laughs> they always had film in their cameras. Except for the top stage. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, I look forward to exploring a whole lot more, you know, Betty goodness with you in the future. I look forward to it too, uh, Tori. I'm very excited about it. So just stay, stay in touch with our social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the other places. And we'll be posting this podcast there and uh, let you know when the next one is ready to go. So have a great time out there, all you Betty Page fans. Thanks for tuning in.